मानुषी संवाद में आप सबका स्वागत है वेलकम टू द फिफ्थ जनवरी 2023 एडिशन ऑफ मानुषी संवाद वेल फ्रेंड्स आपको याद होगा कि 20 दिसंबर 2022 को मैंने मैत्री गोस्वामी जी का एक इंटरव्यू किया था इंटरव्यू तो कम था उनका सोचिए लेक्चर था परंतु कुछ उन्होंने ऐसी बातें जो कही शी इज अ वेरी सीरियस ट्रेडिशनल स्कॉलर और परंपरा से उनके परिवार की परंपरा ही इस दिशा की है तो लंबी परंपरा से आती हैं और बहुत कुछ जानती हैं परंतु जो हमारा उस दिन का विषय था कि जाति वर्ण का आज के युग में कोई रेलेवेंस है कि नहीं शास्त्रों ने इसके बारे में क्या कहा है और आज के युग में उन शास्त्रिक कथनों का क्या रेलेवेंस बनता है इस सवाल पे शायद वो फोकस करने को तैयार ही नहीं थी या करना नहीं चाहती थी या शायद उनके पास जवाब नहीं थे या उनको इस सवाल से कोई रुचि भी नहीं होगी ये भी हो सकता है तो खैर जो हमारा वार्तालाप रहा बहुत सिविलाइज रहा ऐसा नहीं कि कोई झड़प हुई या कोई अभद्र व्यवहार उनके या मेरी तरफ से दोनों ने बहुत ही भद्र तरीके से बहुत ही शांत तरीके से अपनी बात कही उन्होंने पूरी तरह अपना मत रखा परंतु हम एक मत नहीं हो पाए तो इस पे बहुत से ट्रेडिशनल स्कॉलर्स ने मेरी बहुत धुनाई की बहुत ट्रोलिंग की आ, मुझे सीधे तो नहीं लिखा अधिकतर ने अपने फेसबुक पेजेस में और अन्य अन्य सोशल मीडिया प्लेटफॉर्म्स पे अच्छी खासी मेरी ट्रोलिंग की और ये भी डिक्लेयर कर दिया कि मुझे तो उनसे बात करने की तहजीब ही नहीं या मेरे पास उतनी क्वालिफिकेशन ही नहीं है ये सही बात है उनके मुकाबले में मैत्री गोस्वामी के मुकाबले में मैं कोई संस्कृत की स्कॉलर नहीं कोई शास्त्रिक स्कॉलर नहीं परंतु थोड़ा बहुत अध्ययन है और कॉमन सेंस भी इस्तेमाल करती हूँ अधिकतर सो आई ऑफ एन गो बाय वे माई कॉमन सेंस टेक्स मी एंड देन लुक फॉर एविडेंस इन आर शास्त्र इन द लिमिटेड मैनर इन विच आई हैव एक्सेस टू देम गिवन दैट आई डू नॉट आई एम नॉट अ संस्कृत स्कॉलर दूसरी ओर बहुत से लीडिंग स्कॉलर्स ने मुझे लंबे लंबे खत लिखे पत्र लिखे ईमेल द्वारा और उन्होंने बहुत ही सपोर्टिव स्टैंड लिया अधिकतर ने इतनी अच्छी अच्छी बातें कही जिस दिशा में मैं उस डिस्कशन को ले जाना चाहती थी उन्होंने उसे बिल्कुल उपयुक्त समझा और बहुत सपोर्ट किया मुझे बहुत सारे और ये सभी ऐसे लोग हैं जिनका मैं बहुत सम्मान करती हूँ तो उसी ग्रुप की चर्चा के बीच में से ये भी प्रस्ताव निकला कि एक एडवाइजरी ग्रुप हम बना लें ऐसे लोगों का जो संस्कृत के स्कॉलर्स भी हैं जो हमारे अतीत को अच्छे से अध्ययन भी किए हैं और आज के युग में भी उस अतीत की क्या रेलेवेंस हो सकती है उसका सम्मानपूर्ण विश्लेषण करने के हकदार भी हैं दे नो हाउ टू ऑपरेट इन द टू वर्ल्ड्स द वर्ल्ड ऑफ द पास्ट विजडम एज वेल एज the challenges we face in today's india since many of these people are very very well qualified scholars so we decided we will have them in the role of an advisory group for manushi so that in future we are well prepared to deal with these questions aur kyunki jati varna aur uske aaj ke yug mein relevance ka sawal बहुत ज्वलंत सवाल है और इसी सवाल को लेकर इतनी धुनाई करते हैं इतनी जहर उगलते हैं इब्राहमिक्स हमारे ऊपर हमारे हिंदू समाज के ऊपर हमारी परंपराओं के ऊपर हमारे सारे 
संस्कारों के ऊपर इतनी जहर उगलते हैं और इसी के आधार पर इन्होंने हिंदू समाज को तोड़ने में काफी सफलता भी पाई है कि ये तो वर्ण और जाति तो रेसिस्ट कैटेगरीज हैं फॉसिस्ट कैटेगरीज हैं इन्होंने इतना न्यायपूर्ण रिश्ता बना के रखा था तथा कथित लोर कास में हालांकि हमारे कहीं भी शास्त्रों में किसी को नीची जाति कहा गया हो ऐसा मैंने तो नहीं पाया अः और है भी अगर तो आज उनसे कैसे हम डील करें अगर मान लीजिए कोई हमें पुराण मिल जाते हैं जहाँ कुछ ऐसे शब्दों का प्रयोग किया गया है तो उनसे कैसे डील करें क्या शब्द हर शब्द को हम ऊपर डिवाइन रेवल्यूशन मान लेने ऐसा तो हिंदू परंपरा में रहा नहीं तो एक तो हमने उनका एक एडवाइजरी ग्रुप बनाया बहुत जल्दी वो नाम हम अपनी वेबसाइट पे डाल देंगे और जो मेल्स आए हैं क्योंकि उनमें बहुत ज्ञानवर्धक बातें हैं उनको भी हमारे वेबसाइट पे हम पब्लिश करने जा रहे हैं मैं इकट्ठा करे जा रही हूँ क्योंकि वो चर्चा अभी भी जारी है तो उन्ही ग्रुप उन्ही उसी वार्तालाप के बीच में हमारे प्रिय मित्र कॉन्ड्रेड एल्स्ट Who doesn't know Conrad Elst? He is one of the most loved figures among those who are today standing up for Hindu dharma, Hindu civilization. He has done decades ago what um, many of us should have done. Uh, the kind of scholarship. Conrad has offered to the world and paid a very heavy price for it, because in Western academia, then he could not get a good job, for which he is eminently qualified. He could have been a high and mighty professor in one of the Ivy League universities if he had indulged in Hindu bashing, on the strength of his scholarship. But he did the opposite, which is, he found good reason to stand in defence of. Hindu dharma and the civilizational heritage, but he is not a blind bhakt, and he is not a blind traditionalist either. So here is Conrad Elst, and he is going to speak on an outsider's view of jati, varna versus caste. In some ways, he is not really an outsider, Conrad. You have actually participated in these discussions so passionately, so intensely with some of the leading scholars like Sita Ram Goelji. You had very good relation with that entire group of scholars, um, and so you can't be called a total outsider. But yet, yet you are an outsider. So tell us. What do you have to say about the debate, the way it went that day, and what relevance it has? What's your view on that? Yes. Well, uh, on the issue of of caste, or rather jati and varna, I am very much an outsider. You see, there are, are aspects of Indian politics that I know pretty. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Baba. I'm Conrad, not sure that even I'm my sorry. closest friends you know really that, divulge uh, what exactly caste means in their life. So I have a theoretical knowledge, what scripture says about it, about the real life application of, of Varna and Jati. I'm not sure. I have an impression, but I, I don't want to really rely on that. But no, it's good... I'm Sometimes an outsider's view is good. Like, um, you see, when Western Orientalists started studying the Veda, they only had the text. You see, in India, people say, yeah, but you need to have it being taught to you by masters and so on. Yes, but their oral tradition over thousands of years has been susceptible to all, all kinds of changes. Whereas if you go back to the text itself, you are communicating with the original composer thousands of years ago. And so that's the value of once in a while consulting an outsider, you know, who, who looks at this with a fresh mind, 
unencumbered by everything that has grown up around it ever since. Yes, please go ahead. So tell us, how do you evaluate that debate uh, with Maitri Goswami? What do you have to say on these issues? Please go ahead. Yeah, well, <laughs> the, um, the historical issue is really quite simple. Um, it, it was already identified by uh, the Arya Samaj in the 19th century. There's lots of objections to the Arya Samaj theology, but their view of the history of the Vedas was, in this respect at least, entirely correct. Namely, the Vedas don't have caste. Bus. And <laughs> so that's quite important. They themselves took the Vedas as absolute authority. I don't do that. But either way, the historical fact is that no caste in the Vedas. One second. Are you using the word caste as a synonym of jati? Ah, yeah, well, yeah, okay, sorry. Uh, yes, I know this is a sensitive issue, so I, I was not being careful by using the word caste. Um, you see, caste was introduced in India by the Portuguese. Well, let's first have uh, jati and varna. What do the Vedas say yeah. about jati and varna? Yeah, yeah, then okay. How they turned it into, caricatured it in the form of caste. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, okay, I, I agree that the word Varna and Jati are preferable also because they are more precise. So, okay, let's stick to that, drop caste. Well, <clears throat> you see, there is no Jati and really also no Varna in the Rig Veda until the very end, which is the Purusha Sukta. And even that is not sure if it's Vedic, some scholars say that it's a later interpolation, you know, to give some Vedic justification to caste, to, <laughs> to, to, to Varna and Jati. Uh, but actually, there is no Jati in there. There are four Varnas. There are no Jati in there at all. So uh, the two defining elements, namely hereditary profession and especially endogamy, are not mentioned in there at all. Shortly after the completion of the Vedas, uh, or around that time, you know, they are traditionally uh, finished, edited by uh, Veda Vyasa, you have examples of how this endogamy criterion didn't operate at the time at all. So the sage par excellence, the one to whom Guru Purnima is, is consecrated, namely Veda Vyasa, uh, is born from a, a caste mixed union. And she is the sage Parashara, a descendant of uh, the Vedic sage Vasishtha. He, uh, he takes the ferry boat across the river and he is ferried across by the daughter of the ferryman. And so halfway they like each other. There's an island in the middle of the river they, uh, they go there, they make love. And the result, sometime later, is a little boy who grows up to become Veda Vyasa. That's why he's called Krishna Dvaipayana, the dark one, because his mother is dark, um, from the island. And so he's the sage par excellence, yet in, in modern Varna terms, you see, it's, it's a Varna Sankara. You have the, the Brahmin Parashara, and the Shudra, actually, she turns out to be a Kshatriya, but at any rate, not a Brahmin. So it is an inter-Jati uh, inter uh, or inter-Varna uh, union. And so from there comes the sage par excellence. So his being treated as a Brahmin is not at all impaired by the fact that his mother is not one. So there you see that at that time, uh, jati in the modern sense of endogamy was not there yet. And so later in the Mahavarata story, where Varna appears, even there you have to be wary of when this was written. It's written about events in the middle of the uh, second millennium BC, but it may have been written a thousand or even 1500 years later. Like for instance, when Draupadi 
refuses to consider Karna as a candidate for uh, competing for her hand because she thinks he is of low caste. So you see, that may be a later insertion, just like in, in the case of the, the Ramayana, the Shambhuka episode is very, very probably a much later insertion. Okay, so go ahead. Uh, I want you to expand it a little further. Uh, mm -hmm. When does endogamy and jati-based union become important enough to be normative? Because they are not, up, e even right. in Mahabharata, they're not. They're not normative in Mahabharata. And it's very important also that none of the leading characters in Mahabharata are born out of a regular wedlock. Hmm. Almost all of them are, uh, you know, to, in today's parlance, people would use very derogatory terms for them. Right. Because well, you see, this, this goes in stages. The concern for caste purity starts with the, the upper caste. And you have a famous uh, example no, in the no, life of... No, 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 Please don't ah, I really have to learn. Thank you for yeah. keeping me sharp. Yes. Okay, so you see, it is in the upper Varnas that the concern for Varna purity starts. And so we have a, a good episode in the life of the Buddha where you can see this. Uh, a friend of his is the king of Kosala, namely Prasenajit. And so his son uh, discovers that his mother is not a real Kshatriya, that his father has been fooled into marrying a woman who is not a Kshatriya. And so he protests, he says, how could you be so foolish? Now I am not a Kshatriya because my mother isn't. And so then Prasenajit consults with the Buddha. And uh, so the Buddha says, well, you see, it's very simple. Uh, Varna is determined by the father. So at that time, you still had a halfway stage in the history of Varna. Namely, it is purely patrilineal. So you inherit the job of your father, like the son of King Prasenajit, uh, Virudhaka, is slated to become king himself. But the uh, Varna of the mother doesn't matter at all. Now, that's what the Buddha says, but the Buddha at that time is a very old man. So he has been involved in politics in his 20s, but at that time, that is more than 50 years ago. So two generations downwards, this prince Huyudaka has a different opinion. He says, yes, you see, there's endogamy. People have to marry within their varna. So my mother ought to have been a kshatriya too. Now I am not a real kshatriya. So there you have a, a transitional stage. So, so clearly, may I, may I the purely patrilineal a... caste is giving way to endogamy. Uh, but going far, far, far back, which is Mahabharata again. Now, King Shantanu uh, marries a fisherwoman. Uh, he's, uh, she's a chieftain uh, son, I mean daughter. Um, now, obviously, neither Kshatriya nor Brahmin nor in today's parlance, she would possibly be SC. <laughs> you know, the, if the British had their way, they would have called her SC or OBC or EBC, whatever. So way back, that dynasty also, look at the amount of intermingling of the Varna. Now, what, you're also using the term Varna and Jati uh, sort of uh, syno as synonyms, which in a way they're not, right? Mm -hmm. So let's... No, no, they're certainly not synonyms. Uh, there are four Varnas. You know, there are there is a layeredness yeah. in any complex society. You see, among primitive people, hunter-gatherers, everybody does the same thing. Everybody goes hunting, everybody gathers berries and so on. So there is no differentiation yet. But in any advanced society, like the Harappan society, 
you get this differentiation, you get layers in society. And so those are the Varnas. Now in the Purusha Sukta, it is not at all explained how people are recruited into the Varnas. It is not said you have to be born from an, a father from the same Varna, let alone both your parents have to belong to this Varna. So this is not explained at all. No, the, they didn't need to explain simply because, you know, they didn't have to deal with Abrahamic hostile um, enemies of dharma in order mm -hmm. to explain everything at length. There, yep. there was no need to do that. Now, the point mm -hmm. I would like to ask you is this. My point with Maitri Goswami was that Varna, as they say, Yatha Nam Tatha Gur. Varna is to adopt, right? Oh, uh, and it's profession based. It's occupation based. So if you are a Kshatriya, which means that you have chosen that particular occupation, that particular dharma, not that you are necessarily born of uh, what um, of a father who is a royal warrior. That's the point I was trying to make. Clarify. Mm -hmm. So, what would you say? Yeah. To well, you see this um, this slippage into a generalization of varna and ojati among the Hindu population. That is even more recent, and nowadays it can be identified thanks to genetics. So, what genetics shows is that the division of the Indian population into a box type series of communities that don't intermarry. This only dates from about 200 AD. So it's less than 2000 years old. So it starts with the upper layer in about 500 BC. It gets generalized by 200 AD. Then everybody starts to practice this jati. And so it's not older than that. So any claims that this is sanctified by the Vedas are demonstrably untrue, both textually demonstrable and now also genetically demonstrable. See, firstly, I don't trust Western genetic studies. They played okay. enough dirty games, even with their own society. And all kinds of ugly racial theories have come out of genetic studies. So... Uh, let's not even refer to them as an authoritative source. The day um, this uh, society will carry out its own genetic uh, exploration, I'll begin to take it more seriously. As of now, mm -hmm. I put it in the garbage basket because they're too uh, devious to be trusted with anything. Now, the point that I wanted to check out with you is this. Like, for example, from then till date, for a potter's daughter, a kumhar, bringing in a, a daughter of a kumhar family, which is a varna. Kumhar is a, would you agree? And then if you keep marrying within your varna, you become a jati. It makes mm -hmm. sense, eminent sense, because if a kumhar's daughter is married into a weaver's family, well, the entire economic activity of that family is something she's not familiar with. She can't become part of it. It would take her long years to become a productive member of that economic unit. And therefore, mm -hmm. to my mind, it makes eminent sense that a Kumhar's daughter marries into a Kumhar's family so that the rituals, the knowledge tradition, the Gyan Parampara, as well as lifestyle that goes into being a kumhar is perfectly matched. So she doesn't walk into this house as an alien, right? It's like today, mm -hmm. somebody who has uh, done fashion designing, marrying into a family of lawyers, you know, she's going to be a bit of a sore thumb because the entire family or family of physicists or scientists Mm -hmm. so they won't even have common conversations between them. Uh, now, the point that I'm trying to make is that Varna, meaning an occupation, what you adopt, 
and then if you keep intermarrying within that varna as an economic imperative and a convenience and a cultural convenience also because your rituals your way of life your food habits your language everything revolves around that economic activity and yeah. all of these activities were sacred activities there is not a single economic activity among hindus which is not been taken seriously which comes out very clearly and it humbles me that even a humble cobbler who sits on the road side repairing old shoes torn sandals does daily puja of his implements his ozars mm -hmm. are worship worthy he doesn't start the day's business without a little bit of a puja of those implements and then of course on vishwakarma day they all take a break from work that's the yeah. day where they all devote to worship of lord vishwakarma now the point that i'm making is this from varna to jati would you not say that varna is the occupational grouping that you adopt which you can mm -hmm. change if there was no bar on a kumhar or a weaver taking to arms and very often people did get mobilized no, during true. emergencies and some then stayed on got recruited into the rajwaras as their soldiers and then they become satyas but from varna to jati is when people of the same varna who intermarried uh for generations then become a jati i mean is this uh, logical yeah. or not mm -hmm. yeah. well yeah actual history of course often uh speaks against uh the theoretical models derived from the shastras so yes i mean this is obvious that uh jatis could take jobs outside the stereotypical job associated with the jati and especially military service you see if a general badly needs people he's not going to discriminate you know anybody is welcome so you see that way particularly the army just like today can be a, a way of social promotion like in um, in in andhra you have the, the kakatiya dynasty of lowly origin and so when the kshatriyas have been defeated by the invading muslims then it is they who do the job and so by their military achievements their status rises so i mean the, the whole jati uh, and varna system is very dynamic and you see that is of course something that in the whole stereotyping of the, the hindu jati system is is insufficiently realized the, on this on this front you see us westerners have a lot to learn true okay so this was basically the discussion that um, you don't have to be born into the varna in order to be the legitimate uh inheritor mm -hmm. of that tradition a, a brahman for example you don't have to be born of a brahman lineage in mm -hmm. order to claim legitimacy as a respect worthy brahman that was where we began to uh, differ so anyway uh, we we'll, we we'll continue with this as i said i can only ask questions i'm not a scholar like you uh or for that matter uh even maitre goswami but i think nobody has final answers and nobody should try and claim that they have final answers to everything the issue is so complex and it spans over thousands of years thousands of years the history of those thousands of years is barely known to us so how do right. we claim with any authority that this was indeed the case all we can go by <coughs> is various uh, shastras with the two great epics the mahabharata the ramayana and the puranas and they are so mutually contradictory at times that you can't say mm -hmm. with 
authority and say that's the final answer. There is no final answer in this matter. That's at least my sense. Ji. Well, there are many approaches like uh, in this context, I can certainly mention Dr. Ambedkar, uh, who says, uh, you see, Jatis are the result of separate tribes who live uh, in a confined manner to themselves and they gradually get integrated in a larger society. And so tribes become Jatis. And uh, that's not illogical. And so there he pays homage, in fact, to the Hindu tradition of nonviolence, not in the superficial and extremist sense uh, given to it by Mahatma Gandhi. But you see the basic understanding that everything that exists has a right to exist. And so the separate identities of the different tribes are preserved even when they come together, form a society jointly, but still every community retains its identity, its cuisine, its dress habits, and so on. And so that's his explanation for the great uh, differentiation of jatis. That's probably not the whole truth, but I think that is also part of the truth. Yeah, everything is part of the truth. My basic question was, is Varna decided by birth or by adopting a certain occupation? Ah, Absolutely. That's well, the <laughs> yes. You see, this, uh, this talk started from a conflict you recently had with the traditionalists. There is another tribe among modern Hindus that also creates problems, namely the apologists. Those who try to mold Hinduism into like the model of expectations of modern people. So today you have egalitarianism, and so they try to force egalitarianism on Hinduism two, three years ago. Uh, in this whole discussion, something that is very often quoted is, is the Bhagavad Gita where it is said that uh, uh, Varna is determined by uh, karma and guna. And so they say, ah, it is therefore not determined by birth. But in fact, karma and guna are themselves determined by birth. You see, you have the same qualities as your parents, roughly. Not and always. You do this... You do the same yeah. work as your parents, mostly in a traditional society. By the time you became a rebellious teenager, deciding, oh, I don't want to do what my father did. By that time, you already know enough of his skill to make it far easier for you to continue in that skill rather than starting something new. So on average, statistically, there is a certain continuity in guna and karma through birth. And so there are elements in the Gita that have, of course, the last 2000 years been taken as a justification of caste, and which I think you can't really read without seeing them as indeed a justification of uh, uh, Varna by birth. Um, two, two, two elements. Um, Krishna. Uh, calls Arjuna to do his duty. Now, you see these apologists say, oh, the duty is what you yourself choose. Well, no. You see, Arjuna at that time is choosing against the battle, against military engagement. And Krishna says you have to do your duty. What is your duty? Well, your Swadharma, the Dharma you have by virtue of your birth into a specific Varna. So he is a Kshatriya, therefore he has to welcome this, this Dharma Yudha that is presenting itself, this, this righteous war. Secondly, uh, both Krishna and Arjuna are basing the case they are making. So one is for the battle, another is against the battle. Now both of them are basing their, their whole argument on the threat of Varna Sankara, of caste mixing. Both of them say, if you follow your course, you're going to end up with what they call 
immorality of women and therefore mixing of varnas. And the other side says, and if you do what you do, then we're going to get chaos and uh, immorality of women and ending with Varna Sankara. So if both sides of an argument are at least in agreement on the necessity to avoid Varna Sankara, I think there you can say clearly that was an agreed upon value in that society. No, I, 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 I have a slightly different take and I'm going to ask you in the form of a question. I'm not yeah. uh, challenging you, but just simply. Now, if this, if you go by the Arjun Krishna Samvad, or that mm -hmm. whole dialogue in the battlefield, why it cannot be called a uh, uh, Varna Sankat in that sense is because mm -hmm. Arjun is not against his dharma as a warrior. No, he's against killing his own kith and kin. His guru is on the other side. His mm -hmm. first cousins are on the other side. His dear ones are on the other side. That is the Dharma Sankat. He is not fighting some alien enemy force. He has mm -hmm. no problem when he's killing, when he's confronted with actual enemies. But within your family, then it's a different uh, dimension to the Dharma Sankat. It's not Varna mm -hmm. Sankat. It's Dharma Sankat. If somebody asks me, to start slaughtering my own kith and kin, then at that time, I'm not thinking of my varna. I'm thinking of them as my kula. Mm -hmm. So in that, yeah, that, that, that's also true. I agree that this is a complex issue. At any rate, I do think that the apologists are making it too easy for themselves. No, I'm saying, he's also not saying, I'm going to stop being a warrior. I'm sick and tired of killing. I don't mm -hmm. want any more blood. I don't want any bloodshed. No, none of that. He has no compunctions about being a warrior. But, but killing his own dear ones and especially his guru. And don't forget mm -hmm. what a trauma it was for him to actually kill his guru, Dronacharya. It yeah. was not easy. It was not easy. And it wouldn't be if for you, uh, Guru is uh, um, is the is the route to the divine. Connect mm -hmm. with the divine. shows the path to the divine. So yeah. I think this this uh, samvad between Arjun and Krishna is not about Varna Sankat. It's about Dharma Sankat. Destroying your own Quran. Well, you have an interesting point, Madhuji. No, I'm just thinking aloud. I mean, it's not that uh, mm -hmm. any. Now, coming back to you, you mentioned in this day and age of egalitarianism. If you look at today's America or Europe, even as recent as late 19th and early 20th century, they had people carrying shit in the most demeaning, degrading fashion. You know that better than me. Mm -hmm. yeah? And those people were not even allowed the community, what, what do they call them? I'm forgetting the name is uh, escaping me. Uh, it'll come to me in a minute. They were mm -hmm. not even allowed to come and perform that cleaning job, cleaning shit job in the daytime. They had to come at night. So they didn't come in, in the view of someone uh, of a supposedly higher status. And are you telling me that this was an example of modern day egalitarianism or even today, for example, people who collect garbage on the streets of New York or London, that truck that comes, I, I, are you suggesting that the president of America is at par with that garbage uh, collector? No. Even well, though it's uh, you see, of course, I agree that there exists inequality and even steep inequality in Western society. But the crucial difference is you can be the son of such a, you know, a dirt collector and yourself becoming something different. You are not condemned to repeating the same job that your father did. Whereas in the traditional Varna system, I don't think there's much of it remaining today. 
But in the traditional final system of for the past the past 16 or so centuries, you see, people who were from the wrong background were treated as permanently inferior. That's like you see, that's, for instance, what Dr. Ambedkar as recently as the 20th century describes. You see, he had become the Minister of Defense of the princely states of, of, of Baroda, and yet he couldn't find an apartment. Nobody would rent to him because of his background, even though his status then was higher than the people he, he would rent from. A, he married a Brahmin woman. B, yes. his mentor was the Raja of uh, yes. Baroda, right? His mentor, who sent him to America? Not uh, not any of his caste brethren. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was the ruler of Baroda who did that, right? Now, yeah. to forget that, number two, Mahars were a martial group. When do they become untouchables? Yeah. During British rule, because the British demobilized... Uh, the entire Rajwalas and their militias. So they lost their Mahars have been traditionally a martial group. They were part of Rajwala. Yeah, army. yeah, I agree. So how could they be untouchable? And who made them untouchable? The British rule. And if the British rule made them untouchable, then he blames it on us. Secondly, see, when you when you talk about uh Jati, Varna, and its uh, transition. We, we have to have a, a point of reference which is pre-Islamic and post-Islamic. Pre-British mm -hmm. and post-British. Because yeah. if you look at the manner in which occupations, like, for example, uh, cleaning shit was organized in Europe, it was truly offensive. They didn't have a sense of uh, mm -hmm. sanitation. I mean, the Europeans learned to brush their teeth mid-20th century. Many even today don't brush their teeth. Uh, mm -hmm. deep. A bathing level of hygiene of an average European was abysmal. Yeah. Truer. Their dental hygiene, you couldn't stand near them, even the royalty, because they had no sense of how to. Now, the point I'm making is, in India, this entire sanitation system, way back, if you look at the ancient ruins of uh, our uh, old cities, they had a very sophisticated, uh, and, 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 and the latrines did not require, Bibi Lal has demonstrated this through his archaeological work, that nobody had to carry shit. Shit went into uh, what you would call today these uh, uh, recycling waste uh, latrines. I don't know what mm -hmm. the, the term is. This. So nobody needed to. Very well-developed systems for carrying yes. waste and other waste. We didn't throw them, throw human waste into our wells or in ponds or rivers. Okay. Mm -hmm. Whereas that's what they did in Europe till very recently. They used to pour shit into their rivers. We never did that. So nobody had to carry. How could we have untouchability if we didn't have these very demeaning occupations? That's the point I'm making. Mm -hmm. But Europe had. Yeah. Yet it tries to tell us that they were always uh, allowing this kind of mobility. And similarly, if you look at the Holkers, the Holker dynasty, who founded it? A sheep, uh, Gadaria, sheep breeder uh, family, right? So mm -hmm. if it was so fixed, how could he become one of the most respected rulers or Shivaji himself? Yeah. From a yeah, yeah. I mean, there, of course, it is true that the story of caste is far more uh, variegated caste, than caste, caste. stereotypical, caste. you know, uh, views of caste, say. So, yes, I mean, of course, you see, there are very many misconceptions about caste. That I totally accept. But, uh, you see, what I see happening is that um, these uh, apologists of Hinduism make it too easy on themselves. You see, the caste, uh, sorry, the Varna Jati, uh, history is something that has to be dealt with. 
You see, just like just like the history of slavery has to be dealt with in America and so on. So you see, don't make it too easy on yourself. Now, on the other hand, I understand. You see, the Hindus are being blamed so much for all kinds of things that they have a reflex of no, I'm not playing this game. Okay, forget about the outside world, but among one another, you see, Hindus should look this problem in the face. It's not a priority, but it's something that has to be done. Uh, then by contrast, you have the traditionalists who just don't see a problem uh, because they think caste is okay, so Varna is okay, and they keep on they keep on justifying it, which is really bizarre. I mean, the actual institution is going downhill fast. Even an outsider can see it. Yet, you see, there seems to be a revival of uh, orthodox pleading in favor of uh, Varna. Like, for instance, I, I've had on Twitter a whole number of altercations with people who were defending the, the Shambhuka episode who were saying, yeah, Rama was right in, in killing this low-caste fellow. Oh, well, no, 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 uh, no, no, no. I don't think Shambhuka is justified on the basis of low-caste. I'm sorry. There is, okay. uh, there is far more... Uh, we should have a separate episode on Shambhuka, but because it's yeah. nothing to do with low-caste. Because by that logic, look at how Ram treats Nishad Raja. How Ram treats uh, Shabri, Ma Shabri, literally like a child. He has a worshipful attitude towards her. He eats a jute yes. bed. Now, he, ah. he, you cannot claim that Balmiki or anyone else were trying to play politically correct for future generations, thousands of years later, to say, let, lest he be accused. No, it's not like that one bit. And it, through his with his attitude towards Kevat, the person who takes him across the river uh, while he's on his way to his vanvas. Uh, tell mm -hmm. me, where is it offensive? Where does he say you are untouchable? Where does he say I will not eat from your hands? Where does he treat them with anything other than not just as equals, but embraces them with love? And they embrace him with love. How, how can you well, say that he... Yes. We, this I'm going this to seeming paradox is very easy to explain. Hmm? Sorry. You see, Hindus tend to take their scriptures way too literally. You see, if you look at scriptures from a certain distance, you see that they are human products susceptible to all the same things that can happen to literary products elsewhere. So what happens here is that uh, a certain story written by Valmiki gains a great prestige and later generations, much later, a thousand years later, insert their own new messages into it. And so the Shambhuka story, while attributed to Rama, is actually written a thousand years later. And so by that time, society had greatly involved Varna had become far more important. And so uh, what you see here and what the traditionalists typically refuse to understand is that the story, you know, Valmiki, there's nothing wrong with him. But the end product that we have of the Ramayana is the result of a lot of interpolations from later days. In the Mahabharata, it's even more clear and it's even admitted by the Mahabharata writers themselves, where you have a first stage Jaya, the second one Bharata, and the third one Mahabharata. So that's a reduction to three phases of what actually must have been a far more complex process of inserting time and again over a thousand years new ideas, which often are reflective of the later culture that did not exist yet at the time of the war. See, or you're only confirming my point. Firstly, I'm not a traditionalist simply because, as I said, I'm not a scholar of Sanskrit. I'm not a scholar of mm -hmm. Vedas. I'm not even a Mahabharata scholar. My familiarity is that of, a, in a way, an, a very uh, interested lay person, right? I don't claim to be a scholar. Mm -hmm. However, and I have written it time and again. 
one of the amazing positive aspects of our tradition is that even our devatas don't claim perfection they don't mm -hmm. claim that you know here we have abrahamic gods acting in the most nasty vengeful fashion and yet they are supposed to be perfect their commands mm -hmm. are supposed to be obeyed blindly none of our devis or devatas gives you commandments they don't say thou yep. shall do this or else you will burn in hell thou shalt worship me or else i will throw you into hell fire thou shalt not do this or do this this upon pain of death there is none such secondly they do not claim perfection they do not claim perfection mm -hmm. and hindus are quite comfortable with that because then if there is something that bothers them even about maryada shri purushottam ram is maryada purushottam okay he is not supposed to be god with a beard sitting up there uh, 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 the best of human uh, beings or best of me men even he when people feel uneasy about x or y or z we don't need this banal mentally retarded uh, missionaries to tell us how to deal with issues that bother us for example mm -hmm. shambhu if it bothers us sure or bali vad it bothers some people sure people have written about it nobody gets upset provided provided you actually study the text properly you don't take it out of context you don't take an interpolation um, you know or take a manusmriti for example and make mince meat out of it by two lines totally out of context but a thousand lines there may be would say women have to be worshiped like goddesses a family cannot be happy where women are not worshiped where they they remain mm -hmm. tearful you don't take that into account you take two lines which may or may not be interpolated no yeah. text claims perfection no text claims obedience so what's your problem if i don't like x text if i don't like ram and his conduct towards x y z i don't have to stand in defense of it even as a devotee i can say prabhu ram the rest is okay but i am not happy with what happened in that All incident right. no he minds it so what is your problem whereas the other side are completely barbaric minds who lived by barbaric standards who mm -hmm. have, who cannot claim egalitarianism as their dna no far from it they're racist they've been classes also european the whole idea of chain of being how much more hierarchical you can get you know serfdom was prevalent till 19th century yeah yeah of course and what no, is no, inequality of course widely existed no, 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 but no, you no. see so the history so of the so west is such that they turned against it at some point thanks to the enlightenment philosophy then in the next stage christian uh, zealots like william wilberforce took this new wave over tried to christianize it and so started campaigning against slavery and so this is a merit that you can't deny this christian missionary because that's what he was you know he campaigned successfully for allowing the christian missionary into east india company uh, domains but at the same time he campaigned against slavery which finally was outlawed then britain as the major world power used its power to force other countries to abolish slavery like they supported the ottoman empire against russia in the crimea war and they exacted a price from the turks okay we're going to help you you're going to save your skin but in return you have to abolish slavery which the turks did at least in the turkish part of their empire in arabia it continued until 1962 in the mogol empire too which still existed as a shadow of itself but part of it still existed slavery was abolished also under british pressure so no, that no, no, history no, no, exists no, 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 no but no, it's it's not over yet you see that history exists you see europe turned from practicing slavery to 
crusader against slavery. Now, what is the consequence? You see, many Westerners feel that they have to save the world. They have to abolish racial slavery wherever it exists. Now, where does it still exist? Well, the idea is widespread that the caste system is a form of racial slavery. It's at least steep inequality, and it is interpreted as racial because of the Aryan invasion theory. You see, there is this still present uh, widespread opinion that it is the white Aryans who invaded India and imposed a caste apartheid system on the dark natives. Now, this you, totally is unscientific, but it's still very widespread. No, but it's it's not a theory. It's a it's it's actually a scam. You can't even call it a theory. It's a scam, and it's an evil scam, as evil as mm -hmm. this COVID scam, and yeah. with same intent. Number one, slavery comes into India with Islamic conquest. That I'm sure you'll agree. They actually yeah. captured acts of Hindus and sold them as mm -hmm. slaves, separated them, and women also brought into flesh trade, put in harems, put in brothels, uh, all those kothas, yeah. turned into singing girls, kanises, etc., etc. Secondly, to say that the British abolished slavery is such, such an insult to their barbarism, <laughs> because I'm sure you've read this book. Uh, by Dharampalji, Origins of Servitude and Bondage in India. I Not exact title. Mm -hmm. Where, if you read that, you know, when I read it some 35 years ago, I, did, I don't think, away, soon after he wrote it, I think, I don't know when I read it, but it was certainly in the 70s. I couldn't sleep that night. It's the story mm -hmm. is so horrific. The kind of bondage, servitude. Firstly, we had no landless poor. And Dharampalji establishes with their own British record. The wonderful thing about Dharampalji's uh, entire research is that he bases it all on the records he found in the British Museum or in the office library of their own, of the British administrators writing about India, what they were doing, how they were mobilizing slaves. Then, of course, they took bonded labor, Hindus, to Fiji, mm -hmm. to uh, all kinds of countries where they had to do plantations, where they introduced plantations. On such a wide global scale, they introduced slavery. Bonded labor is another name for slave labor, right? Mm -hmm. And bonded labor as well as landless poor. Because pre-British India, if you... Uh, if the harvest failed due to natural or any other causes, you did not have to pay the lagan or the tax to the ruler. No, it was all forgiven, especially Hindu kingdoms. It never was. So nobody became landless mm -hmm. simply because they could not pay uh, the lagan or the land rent to the ruler. But the Mughals did that. They took away. But British on a scale unprecedented and on a scale unprecedented, we witnessed the creation of landless poor, which didn't exist, and slave labor, which didn't exist in the form that the yeah. British... Well, oh, of course, I entirely agree that um, what the British did uh, was not so nice. Uh, even when they had abolished slavery, they imported... What happened? Yeah. Your voice is gone. Your voice, mic, switch on your mic. Switch on your mic. Conrad, please switch on your mic. Conrad, please switch on your mic. You're not audible. Your mic is off, muted. You muted yourself. Hello, Conrad. Uh, your voice. Can you hear me? Come back. Yeah. 
now it should work. Huh. Okay, so a similar case is uh, um, yes. What's happening? Hmm. Right. Okay, here I am. So, um, the example uh, I'm going to give is from my own country. You see King Leopold II, who has an extremely negative press in Wikipedia and elsewhere. He actually was the uh, uh, abolisher of slavery in the Congo. You see, there was a big problem there of Arab slavery. And so in 1894, his commander, against his own orders, uh, made a war with the Arabs and won. So that's the only war Belgium has ever won. It's in 1894. Now, immediately thereafter, Leopold started a system of exploitation that was strictly not slavery, but that was just as bad. So you see the abolition of slavery, of course, you see, it does not make up for all the evil that the colonizers have done. Right. Nevertheless, subjectively, you see, this history of the abolition of slavery works through, you see, has a continuous effect till today in the sense that Westerners with their, you know, Christian complex of wanting to save the world have this idea that they have to go and combat the remaining uh, centers of racial slavery. And so that's how they see the caste system. And so that's where the Aryan invasion theory comes in to explain the caste system as if it is a kind of apartheid imposed by the Aryan invaders on the aboriginals. So you see, this is really bad history, but it's still there and it explains quite a few things. Like you see, when when certain agitators now in America, in England, try to create anti-Hindu hatred, they can count on uh, prepared soil among the masses that have this idea, oh, Hinduism means caste, holy caste and nothing but caste, and caste is really a form of racial slavery. So that's what they build upon when they want to create more anti-Hindu feelings. Madhuji, now it is your turn to become inaudible. No. Did you have mic no, Okay, Sorry. thank you. He muted me, admin muted me. I don't know why. He's trying to get to me for okay. saying something. Anyway, the point that I was making is this. We know that the Aryan invasion theory and uh, caricaturing, not even caricaturing, distorting the entire Jati Varna system, into the casteist mold is their gift and gift with evil intent. It was not a well-meaning error. I make many well-meaning errors where my intention was something else. My knowledge base was not sufficient. So I made mistakes, but that's not what Europeans do. They tell lies. It's like the Islamic art of deceit and, you know, al -taqiyya. Christians are no better at it. The mm -hmm. worst, actually, far worse. Wherever they've gone, they have decimated traditional cultures and enslaved them. What they did in America, Australia, mm -hmm. New Zealand, everywhere, everywhere, and in India, they left us devastated, starving yeah. skeletons. That's what they did to us. So I, I'm really, firstly, on that account alone, not willing to 
heed them one bit. Their credentials are so nasty that I don't heed them. Which is why, I, for example, I refused to take COVID vaccine. I knew it's evil, just evil design. And it's all unraveling now. The point that I'm making mm -hmm. is how they convince. For example, here is one of the products of this uh, is Christianized thinking. He says, when we were discussing Shambhukvad, so one of the neo-Christians or neo Ambedkarites saying, but was it right to burn a woman holika? Now, one woman holika, and how does she get burned? Because that evil father of his, and along with his sister, wanted to kill Prahlad mm -hmm. and put, put that child in her lap saying, you, you are impregnable, fire can't touch you, but this child will rot to, I mean, will roast mm -hmm. to death. And, but some divine uh, retribution, the protective layer around Holika flies off, the child gets saved, and she burns. Not because mm -hmm. anybody wanted to burn yep. her. Her own brother ended up causing her death, but he actually wanted to kill his own son. Then he's saying, but woman was burned. Now look at the evil missionaries, how they spread this. Here is a culture which has actually burnt on the stakes lakhs and lakhs of women as witches, right? Mm -hmm. As recent as 18th century, women were being burnt on a very large scale in Europe as witches. Why? Mm -hmm. And feminists would argue that they were learned women. And that's why they were targeted. Or Joan of Arc, one of the great heroines of the Western world, was burnt on the stake. Why? Because she claimed to be in communion with God. That's all, right? Now, mm -hmm. the point I'm making is that Christianity with this brutal tradition of genocide after genocide, witch killings, telling women that they are born of the spare rib, of Adam, that she that Eve caused the fall of mankind, and that's why um, they fell from heaven, from paradise to this wretched earth. Yeah. It's such an ugly my mythology or whatever you want to call it, and yet they want to teach us egalitarianism, gender equality. I mean, how many lakhs of women were burnt as witches on the stake for no fault? not because they did anything wrong or not because they harmed anybody. And even today, the pornography, I mean, pornography to my mind is direct mm -hmm. descendant of this biblical myth of mm -hmm. the female being the evil temptress and yeah. a piece of flesh for the pleasure of uh, males because she was created as a plaything, right? Eve had no real justification to be. Yeah. And yet we well, are taught equality, gender equality by this culture. Even within the uh, biblical tradition, though, there are rather more friendly spins put upon the story of Adam and Eve. Like, uh, for example, um, in the Talmud, it is said that, um, you see, women was not taken from a piece of skull of, of the men because then... And I quote, I'm not saying this, I quote, then she would imagine herself to be his equal. Okay, so that should not happen. No, she was taken from his rib. Why? Because this way she will always be close to his heart. So you see, that's a, a somewhat friendlier way of turning this. So that also exists in the biblical tradition. Uh, you can't entirely reduce it to the evil that it has done, just as in the case of Hinduism. Here and there, you have to admit some not so good things, but certainly you can't reduce Hindu civilization to those. Uh, all I'm saying is, even if you say that biblical myth has this variant, it's not very ennobling, and certainly not as ennobling as Feminine being the Shakti that moves the entire universe. Of There's course, a, of course. So mm -hmm. I can't even treat them as equals. Honestly, 
today it's mm-hmm. very hard to take the european civilization seriously and yeah. even treat them as equals uh, or worthy of debate and discussion we have to deal with it only because a certain number of people in our country have been brainwashed thanks to macolyite education thanks to thanks mm-hmm. to the royal yes. uppers and the uh, islamist uh, mafia capturing our educational institution otherwise i wouldn't bother with them if they left us alone honestly i wouldn't bother with europe mm-hmm. uh, i feel uh, totally disgusted by its history and present day practice i no respect for it but i have to deal with it simply because they have wiped yeah. the brains of us so many of us in india that's the only reason otherwise i'm happy to ignore them i wish they would ignore us and leave us alone and take their missionaries back they need them in europe they really need yeah. people abandoning christianity by the droves i wish they would save christianity there why don't they do that mm-hmm. but we are so far away from where we started but mainly i think my question to you last question we've really strayed far off to my mind this traditionalist versus modernist is in a way not the best way to look at it but to recognize that there are no simple answers when you are dealing with the hindu tradition which is millennia old and so many records have been destroyed so many original texts have been lost to us thanks to mm-hmm. these events and the continuity being so uh, so barbarically broken that's my point yeah so well yeah well you see as a scholar i see i see this as a an intellectual problem namely you see the traditionalist practice what is called among historians an invented tradition that is to say A, a tradition that claims to be ancient and that is in fact relatively recent you see the idea that caste is intrinsic to hinduism that you're not a good hindu if you don't practice varna and jati okay uh, that's relatively recent that is to say by indian standards 2000 years is relatively recent so the whole period before that the vedic age there was no varna and jati uh in other respects also because you can you can explain this 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 reinterpretation of caste this projection of caste back onto the vedas you can explain this as a specific case of a larger phenomenon you see there are more cases of invented tradition for example the idea that the vedas are a revealed scripture just like the quran is a fairly recent idea in the vedas itself it is not present at all and so you see it is an understandable human process that the vedas as they became more prestigious as they also became the bone of a whole cluster of new sciences linguistics astronomy mathematics it became so prestigious that it was divinized just like rama and krishna after long after they died you see in the retelling they became ever bigger and they became divinized so you see this this all happens this is all understandable but you see as historians we have to say well this divinization is not really historical the vedas were a human product uh, they were still free of caste not because they were anti caste they didn't know about caste this caste was just not varna was just not present in their society and so to project these ideas onto the ancient time to say that uh, varna and jati are intrinsic to hinduism they were created by god at the time of creation as traditionalists say you see that simply is unhistorical and that can be shown by the scriptures themselves you know leave aside genetics or other new things i fully agree with you that this tendency to divinize say the vedas is foolish and yeah. counterproductive because then we are really trying to copy them who um have a bad tradition anyway because um by calling some uh, text as a divine revelation doesn't enhance its stature 
because then you can't engage with it in any meaningful way and you mm-hmm. do what they do to quran uh, sartan se juda so i'm not yeah. one of those but more importantly you mm-hmm. also then went on to equate the divinization of ram or krishna as following the same neo hindu tradition i would differ with you there because mm-hmm. the very definition of divine in the hindu sanatan tradition is the divine dwells in each one of us number one mm-hmm. not sitting up there there's no divine up there in the heaven okay and up in the sky seventh sky or eighth sky and bearded man who's giving commandments there's no such thing so there's no revelation coming in that fashion however if there is divine as well as evil in each one of us and the proportion is what matters like my mother used to say you know har ek mein ishwariya gun hai aur har ek mein rakshasi gun hai gun hai and she would tell me if you want to deal with people in a manner that brings out the best in them then make sure the rakshas sleeps goes to sleep and the ishwariya gun manifest right. enable the person now those who did not need a madhukeshwar to bring out their ishwariya gun a ram for example now i did mm-hmm. not grow up Uh, taking ram as divine does that in the other it was just part of you know the air we breathed i i, I wasn't a devotee of any serious kind but mm-hmm. when you read the ramayana my god the description of how he lived his life then this is the divine in him that actually exists in some small measure in me but not manifested not flowered and blossomed in the way that it did in ram so he becomes worship worthy just as we consider our parents worship worthy right and in mm-hmm. fact the worship of your parents is considered the highest form of worship you can ignore god the whole story of vitthal you know he just threw a brick um at krishna when he came and said wait i'm busy for the moment and and krishna stood there that's mm-hmm. how this whole uh, story about uh, vitthal uh, evolves that divine element if we can see it in snakes in every mountain in every tree in every aspect of nature when well, why not in a ram krishna or any other person or some of the great gurus or shankracharya now i would not say uh, he was an avatar or a prophet in the way that muhammad ji was but mm-hmm. certainly there was a lot of divine power divine power meaning that power that moves the universe in creative ways manifesting in the life span in that tiny life span of shankaracharya mm-hmm. so in that sense div Div- divinity seeing divinity and considering ram or krishna because through the story of ram i really believe if it had it, if it becomes the emotional staple diet of young people how ram mm-hmm. lived life sthit pragya uh, how he handles adversity porush virta all that his uh, relations with diverse human beings n- not just the royalty but the humblest human beings well mm-hmm. he is worship worthy and if you teach children to worship ram what you're saying is not go do aarti i don't but worship these qualities so you internalize them in that sense they are worship worthy they are worth being treated as the best manifestations of divine in the human form that's the point mm-hmm. we need to remember when dealing with hindu uh, devis and devatas as distinct from the abrahamic god okay on that we can agree thank you thank you so much your concluding comments and then we wind up whatever we've had a well, uh, 
Yeah. Very ranging conversation with me interrupting you ever so often. But honestly, this subject is is touches yeah. the very me. Yeah. Well, in the real world, you see your own struggle for uh, more equality, for for equal rights in society, uh, makes this this quarrel over what Scripture says a bit theoretical, a bit outdated. You see, nevertheless, okay, people keep on troubling us with us with it, so we have to give them an answer once in a while. But so basically, what is happening in the real world is more important and is going basically the right direction thank you and your any upcoming book a lot of people are keen to know what me your... well uh, there is a book on uh, iodia that is now with the publisher so it should come out next week or so so oh, it's wow. it's a round off it's a it's a late comment on the whole iodia affair with all kinds of new data that have come to light i suppose you see this is the end of uh, my own iodia phase Okay, so this is your, as they say, swan song. Is that the term they use? The last bit, goodbye, Ayodhya, I've had. Okay, yes, kind of like that, yes. Kind of, kind of. Okay, viewers, since there are no super chat uh, address to Conrad, so we'll wind up here. So, Kripya, yeah. please do share, like, support and continue giving us your feedback, critical feedback, as well as tell us what you prefer to watch on this channel, what kind of discussions make more sense to you. And uh, we really take each one feedback very seriously. So share kije, like kije, subscribe kije, or support kije this channel ko. Dhanivad, Shubratri, Namaskar, or when they matter.